Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this IICC webinar, Regulation in Times of Pandemic and Lessons for the Future, African Responses, West Africa. I'd like to introduce the panelists to you all. And we have Professor Umar Gaba Dambata, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Executive Officer of the Nigerian Communications Commission. We have Patricia Obonai, who is CEO of Vodafone Ghana. We have George Sarpong, who is Executive Secretary of the National Media Commission in Ghana. Aboyomi Adabanjo, who is General Counsel for Main One. And Olu Teniola, who is National Coordinator for the Alliance for Affordable Internet, A for AI. And I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion today um, because this discussion is very timely. The, during the period of lockdown in the UK, which started back in March, I have been doing two bits of work. One, uh, dealing with um, cloud providers and data centers. And through that, I have begun to understand that actually what was five years ago, simply conference um, promotion, sort of bigging things up actually has become a reality. People are now using the cloud. And the second piece of work was a survey of broadcasters. And the very interesting thing there was that actually broadcasters were using Zoom, using Skype, using any manner of cloud platform that they could in order to get onto, to get people to participate in the broadcasts that they were doing. And that also they, they were taking their work processes um, up into the cloud as well. Both of these things have, in a sense, been accelerated by COVID-19. Um, so I want perhaps to start, my first question is in a way to kind of create a baseline, which is to ask what was happening in the country you are from before COVID-19 from your perspective, so that we've got some sense of what is either being accelerated or not accelerated. So Patricia, what is, what is happening in Ghana, for example, um, that you saw before COVID-19 and perhaps has accelerated with COVID-19? Good afternoon, everyone. So um, in Ghana, we were seeing network traffic pick up. However, we saw a dispersion of traffic where people were staying in the offices. There was a lot of work from people staying in the offices and relying on office connectivity. Um, we also saw most employees, um, work from home was not a thing. A lot of companies had flexi working, but it was not a big thing. I think the, big, the two big changes that we've seen with COVID is a complete shift in the network traffic dispersion where people are literally working from home and not relying on office connectivity. And so the demand for broadband um, and also the demand for stable mobile connectivity and faster speeds um, has significantly changed. Thank you, Patricia. Professor Dombato, what, what, from your perspective, ha was happening before COVID came along? What we, Frank, was you, Russell. Hello, everyone. Um, we were not altogether taken unawares by the COVID-19 pandemic. We were reading about it um, and therefore started getting ready. We know eventually it will get to this part of the world where we are. And as such, I started preparing in earnest in order to ensure resiliency of our networks to see whatever we can do to ensure resources are available for our mobile network operators, you know, to use and deploy and increase capacity in order to contend when the impending, uh, the impending traffic that we know will come uh, on the network uh, we were taking measures to ensure the infrastructure and specifically the networks are ready to cope with the volume of traffic that will result uh, as a result of, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. And what had happened about things like the um, interconnect debt, which was an issue that was there before COVID, is that continued to it be there? It is still it is still high. It was um, a figure that is in the region of about sixty five billion naira a uh, couple of um, months ago, to be specific, in twenty nineteen. Um, we convened a meeting of all the operators in order to find a way that this debt issue can be you know addressed. 
and you know the various mobile network operators that attended the meeting um, went away with a commitment to finally address this huge interconnect debt. I think that is the situation. Then we intend to do an evaluation of the situation and find out how far have those measures we have put in place yielded you know some results. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dambata. George, what, what from your perspective in Ghana was happening before COVID-19 that perhaps has accelerated? I, I think Patricia adequately captures the realities, particularly in the telecom sector. Perhaps just a little on the, um, let's say, content regulatory sphere, I think the greatest issue that emerged was the question of disinformation and what should be the regulatory responses to that. Okay. So, Olu, from your perspective, somebody who's concerned with closing the digital gap, what, what were the trends before COVID-19 that maybe have been affected? I think um, from the perspective, but I think uh, Professor Dambata has put some things in context and Patricia has laid out a couple of things that are common uh, to the operators. But one of the areas that I think that uh, we already knew, uh, back in Q4 2019, uh, there was a, a major surge from uh, the telcos to start to deploy more <clears throat> 4G infrastructure uh, to meet demand. Um, when uh, COVID came to Nigeria, and that was around February, I remember in Q1 of 2020, uh, that had already been priced in. And I remember giving an interview to CBNC, uh, CM, CNBC, sorry, uh, Africa, where they asked a question, um, if COVID uh, persisted, what would happen to the industry? Where well, we had already priced in a, a positive Q1, which we uh, did uh, achieve. It was a positive Q1. But what we saw was a ramp up in Q2. I mean, you know, by the time COVID had already taken effect in around March, as Patricia has highlighted, going into June, when it was really very uh, acute. Uh, the stay-at-home directive by government had meant that there was a much wider usage of OTT applications. I don't want to name names, uh, including virtual tools like the... Mm. And we seem to have lost Olu momentarily there. So I'm going to move on to Abayomi. From your perspective, pre-COVID, what, what was the trends that you could see? Well, I think I agree with uh, what uh, the other partners have said, uh, especially the EVC. Um, there was a lot of strong focus on network resilience. But where I will pivot slightly is that pre-COVID, also we, we, we saw, uh, and because maybe we're in the co-location business as well and the cloud business, uh, we saw that um, as um, companies and corporate organizations wanted to optimize resources and also achieve scale, um, they, they started, there was a shift to, um, um, to the cloud, a strong shift to the cloud and also a strong bias for co-locating the equipment or uh, servers um, um, in order to optimize uh, their resources. Um, uh, and also what was underpinning that also, or as a strong corollary to that, also was um, the NDPR came out, which is um, the Nigerian version of the GDPR, and which uh, also, you know, um, really focused a lot on um, data protection and data residency uh, uh, emphasis. So um, the the with COVID happening, uh, I think for those corporates that are taking the initiative early enough uh, by moving and shifting resources to the cloud uh, or by co-locating their equipment uh, uh, with uh, data, data centers, local data centers, um, it sort of validated that decision for them. Um, and it obviously uh, it allowed them to be nimble and flexible in terms of their ability to be able to work from home and use some of those um, um, uh, platforms that um, Olu was just mentioning before, I think it's back now, um, the OTT's uh, 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 networks uh, that allow the law of convergence, uh, um, communication convergence, um, to be able to use and utilize those resources as well. So I, I think that was one of the key things uh, um, that we saw uh, pre-COVID. Thank you. Yeah, I'm back um, now, Russell. 
Good, I'm pleased to hear it. Um, I don't know what happened there. It was a spike in the network, but just to finish off, and thanks. Uh, do by all means. Uh, by all means. Um, one of the things that was really good is that we saw a collaboration between the industry and government. Uh, government gave us a rights of passage uh, to effectively means that uh, our members uh, under ATCON, that is, um, were able to fuel the, their diesel generators. As you know, in this part of the world, uh, each uh, site has two, uh, two diesel generators uh, for redundancy. So uh, the ability to ensure that uh, uh, we could continue to access those sites was very important. Otherwise, we would have an uh, we would have had an outage, but which didn't occur. Um, even though, as in the UK, like you would be very aware, uh, networks were congested. I mean, I know British Telecom sent out a few customer events to that effect. We also struggled with that. So that just shows you that the change in data pattern from enterprise to home uh, is still an area we need to address. But I'll leave it on that. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on, move on to the meat of it now, which in a way is what have you changed as a result of COVID-19 being there? One of the things I've noticed is several regulators opening up um, categories of spectrum to operators to help relieve some of the congestion that Ola has been talking about. Professor Dambata, were there particular things that you've done or are, are they broad policy things um, in terms of COVID-19? Well, de definitely, um, Russell, um, Spectrum availability was one of the most important steps, you know, taken by making the uh, desired spectrum available to mobile operators by not only doing that, but allowing them to use, you know, the 2G spectrum, you know, in order to drive data services, you know, in the, in the 4G LTE segment. These are some of the steps we have taken. And I remember granting on a number of occasions, you know, um, if you like provisional approvals, you know, for spectrum um, assignment to many of the MNOs in order for them to use that spectrum to uh, expand and uh, sustain services uh, during this very, very difficult period. But if I may go a bit uh, outside this, I would like to say that the government intervention is not just in making you know spectrum available, but we have substantially addressed the right of way issues that in the past has conspired to make deployment of desired you know infrastructure difficult. Also, the president of the country made a declaration, an important declaration, um, that protects critical telecommunications infrastructure. Thank you very much, Rose. And so, in terms of rights of way, did, did all of the states of um, Nigeria sign up to that Well, agreement? I would like to say this. Um, virtually all the states, with the exception of very few, opted for one of the options. One, to adhere to the harmonized, uh, to the harmonized rate of 145. Sorry, I'm I have to give you this figure in Naira, our you know, national currency, uh, for linear meter of fiber. Some reduce the rate significantly, and others waived it all together. This okay. is the situation in this country. Yes, thank you yeah, very much. That's very helpful, Patricia. Yeah, as, yeah. A, a, as an operator, what did you look for from government during these difficult times, and what 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 were they able to provide you with that previously maybe they they weren't able to? So for us, we when China actually shut down. Even if you had a pregnant order, you just couldn't get it into your country. So the first important support we needed was spectrum. And I think government really stretched out their hands to do two things. One, remove the limitation on the U900. So 900 spectrum was being used for 2G. And even U900 was only for rural. Um, with COVID, they allowed us to use it in the city. And so you could expand 3G capacity without waiting for hardware to come in. I think the second big one was giving us spectrum of 4G. And initially they gave it to us from March to June, extended to August, and happy to say it's now extended to February at no cost to us, so that we can carry the traffic. What we saw on social media, people's agitation was, was not really on price. They were working from home and they wanted network to have capacity. They wanted a stable connection. And I think government's response was, was very helpful. 
The third one was actually taking the charge. So in Ghana on mobile money, we have interoperability. So amongst operators, you can send across the switching platform. However, there's a charge. What they did within that period was to, to absorb the charge and, and therefore allow the, um, the telcos to be able to send money, customers to send money across networks without charges. And so it was easier for us to also take the charges on, on even on our own networks every telco took it up. Government gave um, free electricity, free water. So I think just every support to help the industry to stand, uh, we got it. Thank you. Um, Abiyomi, you, you mentioned something a moment ago, which I think we should go into in greater detail, which is the NDPR, which is the Nigerian version of GDPR. If you could explain to people what that's about and what that means, because if one of the impacts of COVID is people moving towards cloud-based platforms, it's quite important to understand what that means as, as other, also other countries think about the same sort of legislation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So basically it's, um, it's um, I think it's a, a local content version of what the GDPR is. And essentially it's providing a policy framework for how you collect, disseminate, uh, use um, data that's collected by individuals or corporates um, um, to ensure the integrity of the data and as well to ensure that it is not being used in a way that is um, um, counterintuitive or that is uh, um, 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 there are so clear parameters on to, in terms of use um, and to ensure privacy of uh, the, the data. Um, I think this is also really important because a, a real a strong corollary to that also is in terms of data retention, right? Um, um, and um, on the data retention part, which has economic impact, it's uh, is sort of laying the basis for um, uh, ensuring that data that is collected within a certain within this geographical area also is retained within this geographical area, and that has significant impact for us as an economy because also um, it ensures that, you know, there's incentive for us to create infrastructure that is able to warehouse um, um, the amount of data that we do have uh, within the shores of uh, uh, the country. Um, and the, the economic connection with that is that the, we hope to see that there are more data centers that are able to absorb all of that information and warehouse all of those information in a way that ensures the integrity of the information, um, uh, the preservation of it uh, without compromising it, especially in an era where we, we start to see a lot of uh, cyber, cyber crime and cyber security. Uh, so there's a lot of emphasis in, short, in terms of just network security, uh, generally uh, on data that is collected, and also in terms of dissemination of that data and use of that data, especially as you know, um, um, since, uh, the era of uh, um, um, the Facebook uh, issues uh, that happened last year in terms of uh, um, 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 uh, the American uh, um, political space. So again, these are all really strong indications from the regulator uh, that he, the regulator is forward thinking and also as the, the, the ultimate uh, balances the concerns of citizens on one hand, as well as um, looking at what is really incentivizing the economy and economic actors uh, to take this opportunity. So I think that was really great. Thank you, that's very helpful. I want to come to George, because George, in terms of COVID, information was key and so if information is key, then content is key because people are reading all sorts of things on social media. Um, in some countries, media was an essential service. Um, how did Ghana react to that in content terms and in terms of content regulation? What are, what are the th things that you managed to do during that period? I, uh, not much, unfortunately. But what I think became very clear to us that a lingering issue about how do we manage the complex question of managing disinformation online then got heightened attention about exactly how do we do this. And uh, it seems to me that for once, all stakeholders began to have a certain feeling that we needed to cooperate to frame perhaps the most democratic response that we could. So it only uh, forced all stakeholders to a certain agreement that we need to begin reflections towards 
how to address this. But we have still not been able to concretely uh, formulate anything to address this. Thank but you, I, If you give me just a second, I wanted no, to ask a quick question to yeah, Patricia. Uh, she adequately outlined some of the wonderful government interventions in the area. There was one, there's one curious thing that I wish she, she could comment on. Is it also accurate that the regulator for the first time began to uh, reasonably ease the, um, uh, how do I put it, the strictness with which they monitored quality of service? Okay, so, well, they, they continue to monitor. Actually, we used to meet them, let's say, once a quarter. We were meeting them once a week, and I was presenting to the regulator every single week. What they didn't do was to find us for their gaps, because I think they understood the challenge in which we were. So it, they came on, on, on board as partners more than holding the stick and whipping us. So we presented the network, we presented um, traffic to our call centers, the overflow and everything like that. And um, they also did drive tests through the cities and then they will share the reports with us. The only thing they didn't do was to say, your fine is say 50,000 canisters and you have to pay them. They were really on, on, on the game with us. Good, yeah, thank I, you. I that's, a, that's, a, that's a helpful point, sorry just hold you there because I want to take Olu um, on lastly on this question on COVID-19 what what do you think the regulatory responses were that were useful and helpful well I shared with you um, one particular area about uh, rites of passage um, you know in terms of operations uh, one of the things about COVID is that um, and I think that our memories uh, really serve us well there was a lot of conspiracy uh, 5g conspiracy uh, was very heated. There was COVID relationship with 5G, you know. So um, one of the things that I think that uh, it has really spurred government is to focus on updating the cybersecurity uh, policy and strategy uh, document that they've had. Uh, that was the last one they had publicized was 2014. Uh, so that obviously led to the fact that they needed to, 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 to drive that. The other areas I think that government had also witnessed is that uh, with COVID and the change in patterns of the way we work, play and communicate with our loved ones and do business is that there's been a recognition that the migration from where we are as is as an economy to a digital form of economy is paramount. So if there was any doubt before COVID-19 really been a catalyst that we needed to drive the economy mm -hmm. forward and diversify. Remain, remember that there was a huge hit on our economies across Africa. Uh, in our case, in Nigeria, uh, we are still reliant on oil. Um, and the price for oil, I guess, even went down to $10 or so uh, per barrel, if you can recall. So uh, that stretched uh, all the parameters that government had in terms of showing up its budget. So the focus now is on digital taxes, uh, you know, and one of the issues around that is how do they um, determine presence of some of these uh, operators that um, are driving the digital economy tools. And then in, in the case that we are seeking is harmonization of taxes because there's a multitude of taxes. So the, the area ar around that is something that I think government is focused on. I think that the other area that government is looking at is the cost of data. Uh, affordability is one issue. I mean, we still have this concern of the haves and have nots. So there is a drive right now to start to, and I know that Professor is on a line listening. He's got a big tall job on his hands to balance cost of doing business against the needs of the consumer who want a quality of service, but aren't prepared to pay an exorbitant a price for that quality of service, but we have a huge infrastructure gap, you know? So that's, that seems to be the area of focus for government, as we, we know. Yes, there are the recurring issues that I think Professor Dambata has spoken to, which is CNI, which we're very grateful for. And obviously the recurring theme of rights of ways, which we realize that to move forward, uh, inf investments shouldn't be taxed, it should be the outcome. So we're still on that journey, uh, Russell. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Patricia, one of the things that Ola was raising was cost of data. Obviously, with COVID-19, there's been a up, you know, an upturn in people using the, both the amount of data and probably the number of people using data. But data is still a barrier to um, wider use of the internet. So what is it from Vodafone's perspective that can be done to close that digital gap? How within your commercial strategies do you think about expanding that user base? There are a number of ways of looking at um, cost of data, and I, I totally understand where Olu is coming from, but I think we need to also place it in context. I think one of the panelists talked about, if you look at the cost of um, data in Europe, the way sites are operated in Europe, I don't think they worry about having two or three backup generators on their sites, right? Operating a site in Africa is expensive, because whilst you worry about the grid, you also worry about being off-grid for a number of hours, and having to provide continuous service. The cost of equipment, landed costs in Africa or in Ghana, it won't be um, cheaper than what I, the person in Europe is going to get, right? You have your taxes, import duties, probably up to 30% on your equipment that lands in the country. You have taxes, your, even if I take out corporate taxes for those who are not um, making profit, you pay up to almost 20, between 22 to 25%. Um, of taxes, you know, um, you, you also have the cost of spectrum. I always say that governments should begin to see spectrum as, as something that will enable the service over a longer period and benefits the economy than an immediate direct revenue source. So if you overprice spectrum, it will go into the cost of data. So for me, spectrum taxes, the cost of operations in Africa, hasn't helped um, in the way we price it. And when, when um, and even in the end, you also have the, the cost of connecting to the internet. That's also hits, hits the African operator. So all these have to be looked at. Um, and, and when you are deployed even into rural, you do not have any supports. Today, government takes 1% of our net revenue and puts it in an infrastructure fund. I think this is it's time I've seen the government making an effort to put in about a thousand sites but these are the active things we need to see change that will help to drive the cost of data down. Okay, thank you. It seems to me that perhaps one ought to speak more loudly about the possibility of getting electricity supplied to more base stations, because it does seem to me the supply of electricity is, is something that is a kind of major cost for operators and yeah. therefore is a big um, ask. I, we, to, be, to be fair, for Ghana, I have literally, 99% of all my sites on grid. It's about stability. Yeah. It's about the availability of the service. And you, you, the service has to be on 24 seven, um, especially yeah. now that people, are, people work over the night and stuff like that. So you need to have the, the power and it has to be stable. Spending money on free wall to power my sites is avoidable. Okay. Professor yeah, Russell, Russell Sorry, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't uh, reflect Nigeria. <laughs> Where it's the opposite. I yeah, mean, exactly, even, exactly. Even in cities, we have so many towers in Lagos that are run on generators and off grid. That's, that's so, uh, yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, so I think you predict a curve there. Um, and the next bit is even if you get grid, um, it has to be clean grid. Sorry, I just thought I'll just chip in that because. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Africa, everything's on grid. Yeah. yeah. And, and Ghana is unusual in that it has quite wide um, coverage for electricity, but actually the, the quality is, is, is very poor in certain areas. Professor Dembata, in terms of this closing the digital gap, what, what is it that NCC can, can do, is doing to do that? Well, thank you, Russell. I've listened um, very well to the debate on data. And my, my take as a regulator on, on this is, in this country, we have data on, you know, the landing points, you know, at the landing points, massive amount of data by four uh, data providers. Main one is this one, because it will attest to what I'm saying, um, MTN, Glow One, Sat3. Combined data capacity is in the region of between 40 to 50 terabytes. Now, if we can find a way to move this data, because it will not move, or, you know, by itself. We simply have to find a way to move this data 
you know, into the hinterland from the coastal parts of, you know, of the country. And to do that, you know, we need infrastructure, both the regional, metro fiber, you know, including bringing in all the 774 local governments, you know, in this country into this infrastructure ecosystem. If we can do that, then I promise you, Russell, we will see the cost of data coming down. It's simply a question of supply and demand. The demand for data far, far outstrips the little data that is coming into, you know, the country, even, even into parts and parts of Lagos, you know, where the landing point says. Um, so my you, my you have special infrastructure licenses, don't you? That you exactly you we do. Yes, well, we, we people like that. How, how have those gone? It's going very well. We are doing a review, and the intention behind the review is to see how quickly the deployment, you know, can happen. And I believe um, by the end of this month, we will come up with a, a, with a position that will speed up, you know, the process of infrastructure deployment to address, you know, the, the problem of data, as well as the complaints, you know, we're receiving daily from subscribers on data depletion, which, which will be something I would like to talk about, you know, when we speak. I have forgotten to mention, Russell, that in order to improve capacity as a result of the challenge posed by COVID-19, we have cleared some spectrum in, in some parts of the, of, the, of, the, of the country, which were hitherto encumbered by broadcast operators. You know, the government has approved payment to the tune of almost $3 billion, you know, to broadcast operators in order to vacate the 2.6 gigahertz spectrum, which, as you know, is a capacity spectrum, you know, in some parts of the country. And the information I'm getting is there is remarkable improvement, you know, in services in those places, which is a tool, you know, this was not the case. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to come to George now and move to the media side of the equation. Um, one of the processes that has been going on is the digital, digital transition in broadcasting. And um, one of the participants, Cecil Amil from SES, has been asking, how is progress in Ghana and how does it look in Nigeria? Um, I don't expect you to make a full answer for Nigeria, but if you could give us some idea how things are going in terms of um, the, the Ghana side of the question, I, I'll ask one of the Nigerian participants to perhaps pick up the other side. I think there are two, there are two sides to that. One is the um, technical work going on. And the second is the policy framework. I think in terms of the technical work, we've done considerably well, but there's lack of clarity exactly where we are. There is debate among stakeholders about certain aspects of the processes. But we think that in terms of the policy framework, there are critical legal and constitutional issues that we need to address, but which for now appear to look like a technical issue. And uh, going forward, it seems to me that- uh, Give, that give, is us, where give, give us an example of, of one, one of those issues. A bit of our effort. Okay, one of, one of them is simply that, be, simply because we need to, uh, Farm spectrum, particularly for Patricia and therefore uh, data services, we, we, we have had to conserve spectrum. And therefore, as a result of that, we are all operating on one broadcast signal distribution platform, the one multiplex, which then becomes a central point of control because it is owned by government. As all of us know, in Africa and particularly in Ghana, anytime you create any opportunity for a government entity to control the access to the means of public communication. You are introducing dangers into the governance system. But what we, we are doing is building a platform that is owned and controlled by government without any clarity over how we uh, address questions of free expression and uh, avoid any danger going forward about government control of the platform. So that is one and there are about eight or nine uh, similar issues that perhaps we may not find time to discuss. But just a quick one, because Patricia raised an issue that I thought Prof could address. When Patricia talked about uh, data cost, the elements that she isolated included the cost of spectrum. 
that certainly is within the regulator's decision. And I thought that uh, Prof could make a comment on that. I'm interested in that because I served on the board of the National Telecoms Regulator in Ghana for five years. And for all five years, I kept battling my colleagues that we cannot look at Spectrum as a cash cow for the state, but rather our attitude should be towards facilitating the industry. I never succeeded in that. And I would be glad to hear uh, Prof's attitude to that point that Patricia made. I think that's a that's a great question because this this also relates to license fees as well because okay both if of I those... may respond, Russell, with your permission. Yeah, by all means. Okay, so um, George, um, in, in 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 Nigeria, we we have since introduced what we call uh, regulatory flexibility in the in the way and manner we assign spectrum and in the way and manner you know payment is made for the spectrum. We normally stagger the payments. Um, to enable the operator assign the spectrum to pay according to a plan that will make the operator continue to provide services using that spectrum and paying for the spectrum over an agreed you know, period of time. This has worked very well to the extent that we have extended it even you know, uh, to uh, the licensing of um, mobile network operators in you know, on, on the pure occasions, you know, they want to renew their operational licenses. We have introduced the same initiative and it's working very, very well. And on top of that, I have not seen really a spectrum piece going up in this country for a while. I don't think they will. I think government is disposed to, re to revisit in the entire regime of spectrum fees with a view to making them affordable for operators, you know, to um, apply and have assigned and I think this will greatly um, impact on the way and manner, you know, MNOs are charging for data, you know, services. The target we were assigned is to bring down the cost of data, you know, by, by the year 2023 to about one third of what it is as we're talking now. And government has put in various plans, you know, to ensure, you know, this milestone is attained. Thank you very much. It's always struck me that it would make sense in the difficult times like this that if you had turnover related spectrum fees. So in other words, people were paying for the amount of well, use want, that they were getting out of the spectrum. Well, I want to say, I want to say this, uh, Russell, that our sector, and Tinola is here, the other guy, main one, all of them licenses of the committee, they are having a very good time. Um, the, the pandemics is an unfortunate development but this is the only sector of the economy in this country that has not contracted. Yep. This is, this is the only sector that in the second but quarter has contributed $5 billion you know, to the economy. This is the only sector that is experiencing continuous rise in contribution to the GDP, especially during this very, very difficult time of the pandemic. Surely, Russell, there is something we are doing at the Commission that is, you know, making the sector both resilient, stable, and therefore, you know, given the kind of, you know, uh, impact, you know, on various, you know, aspects of the society, various sectors, you know, of government, you know, in a way and manner that we are experiencing, you know, growth, you know, impact in those sectors. So we have point, become... point, point taken, Professor, point taken. Thank you very no, much. No need to labor it. No need to labor it. I must come to Olu to go well, back so, to... So, sorry, Russell. Um, hmm. I, I wanted to just uh, pitch in there um, so you can understand a bit of our own, ecos our own unique challenges and the ecosystem that we have here, right? Um, there is, and to emphasize, there is a supply glut in terms of data. And I think that's what the EVC has been trying to... There's a supply glut uh, that we have mm. because we're only utilizing about 10% of the cables that land in Nigeria. But there is a distribution problem as well. Um, um, there's a big distribution problem. But in as much as there's a distribution problem, I think from a policy framework side, um, I think what government has done right, but we should give them, we should give them, um, we should um, um, recognize that is on a policy side, uh, even pre-COVID, there was a strong emphasis on things that um, we thought that could, or they thought that could incentivize the um, continued broadband penetration and, and distribution and solve the distribution problems, which is why there's a strong emphasis on things like right of way, because it has such a real impact in terms of the capex spend 
on uh, by operators uh, for them to sort of um, uh, enlarge their networks so that they can deal with the issue of traffic and congestion. Um, um, in terms of spectrum, yes, um, and by the way, also I know Patricia focused a lot on 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 all those input costs that determines the uh, pricing. Of, of data. Um, I do agree that spectrum is one of them, but that is not the biggest drivers for the, for in terms of the cost components uh, for us. If you were going to do a big analysis and allocate percentages, um, yes, it would be great, you know, if we, I mean, we're all up for it. We, we really want the EVC to, to do that. I mean, who doesn't want that? But in terms of if we're going to allocate the biggest numbers uh, as the, in terms of the cost drivers, uh, um, you would find that there's a bigger allocation uh, would go to other things, um, e.g., um, the cost of running um, those base stations, um, um, base stations deployment is really fundamentally uh, a, a function of lack of electricity and power, powering them all the time. You see that that's a big cost. Um, E.g., you would see that in terms of you know the right of way fees that were being charged, there were people, um, states were charging as high as six thousand. Uh, 7,000, 10,000 Naira uh, per linear meter in terms of right away. You know, addressing those cost components for us is really how we start to solve. I mean, you can solve all the distribution problems at once, but I guess, you know, the, the idea is where does it hurt the most and where would you get the biggest return? Um, uh, which is why I think for now, um, there is an emphasis on some of those things uh, and rightly so. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to come to Olu for the second part of the DTT transition in broadcasting. It's a tough question for you because you're really a telecoms man, but I can't yes. think who else would necessarily have that expertise. What is happening with the DTT transition in Nigeria? Well, I wanted to say something that may give George some chuckles and gives Prof Professor Dambata an outlet. Um, we've had some discussion on spectrum trading it, the mechanism actually works. So there is an avenue for reduced costs on the last mile that uh, Abayomi and Patricia have been referring to. But remember also, uh, there's more to the issue around price cost of data uh, in Nigeria. It's been a recurring theme over the many, many years and it's become much more emphatic now because we are moving from voice to data. I mean, that's the reason why we're having this discussion. But one of the other areas I think that we may need to start to talk about is TVY space, because um, yes, the migration by our Nigerian Broadcasting Corporate Commission, and that's the twin sister uh, regulator for broadcasting spectrum, is, is trying to migrate uh, from analog to digital, that's the digital dividend, and it's taken a bit longer uh, as we expect, but there has been some progress in three states uh, and that progress is quite significant, i.e. the desktop boxes are there, they, the, the, there's a usage of that, but it's the economic situation we find ourselves in. I mean, who could have predicted that uh, COVID would have landed on our shores about eight months ago? Uh, and with that, uh, the constraints of funding this project of migration is somewhat challenged or challenging. So until that's actually concluded, then the broadband spectrum, in addition to the TV white space, will not be available. So, you know, and our members are seeking not only broadband spectrum, but wider bandwidth, because you need to do a lot more with 5G if you have a wider bandwidth. You can't do it with the sort of bandwidth that we've had when we use it, when, which was given for 2G, 3G, even if we farm, I mean, there's only so much that the uh, engineering and science can do. So it's as well notified and FCC is a good starting point where they've actually allocated spectrum in an equal manner. And I think that's something that uh, Professor Dambata has to take away because really it has to be a level playing field. Um, but if you look at what the broadcasting uh, or the broadcasting side of the business is trying to do, um, you know, my argument is that technologies converge. So I'm not saying that we should become an Ofcom, but there has to be a lot more collaboration uh, and synergy in between how, when Spectrum is made available and uh, when it is available to our members. But again, um, I think the question uh, that 
one needs to address is uh, the lessons that Ghana may give to Nigeria, because I think that they've made significantly more progress, albeit they've got a, a smaller population and a smaller geographical space. But I think in terms of the process, it's really uh, hinged on lack of funding. And that's my uh, opinion. And I, and I believe that even if there was funding, uh, we need to expedite in a manner that uh, we can catch up uh, from the, the time loss so that that spectrum can be transferred to the broadband providers that might be migrate onto 5G or 6G in the future because they do need that wider bandwidth. And I wanted to raise the TV white space issue because actually that provides some degree of bandwidth at an affordable rate to allow community networks to spring up in these uh, unser unserved and underserved parts of Nigeria in an affordable manner. Thank you. Thank you, Olo. Um, I want to turn now to the prospects for the digital economy and digital transformation more broadly across the economy. I think we've seen, and perhaps there hasn't been enough of a focus on it, quite a lot of, um, if you like, digital enterprises on the African continent. So people like Oroco TV, I mean, they may be experiencing problems at the moment, but they are nonetheless um, significant organizations in the digital space. I wonder, Patricia, what were the areas, do you think, where, in a sense, the mobile operators can contri contribute to generating a digital economy? So in other words, generating services which sit on the network that will allow people to have jobs and to make things and do things and improve efficiencies within the corporate sector. I still believe that the, the drive to digital, we have quite some fundamental things to address. So whilst we pride ourselves, for example, in Ghana, and I know other African countries do the same, that we have high mobile penetration, 130%, etc. If you look at the unique SIMs, the unique SIMs in the market, we're still around 55%, which means that it's heavily multi-SIM, that um, one person has two SIM cards, and, and then we think everybody has it. So I think the first thing is to drive the mobile access. We need to make sure we can drive penetration into the regions where we don't have coverage at all. I mean, up to date in Ghana, we don't have, I can't say any, any operator has more than 95% on 2G. 3G is still sitting at around 60%, 4G sub, sub 50. So there's a lot to be done in driving access and this requires partnership. If you, if you think about the fact that there's the, the broadband access that has to be defined for Africa, is, is, is going to cost about a hundred million, hundred billion dollars. Vodafone contributes a billion dollars across, across Africa. Something has to be done to close that, that um, access, access gap. I think the second one for me to drive digital would be the, the access to devices. What's the point in having the coverage if the people don't have the handsets in their hands? And it's really about the cost of production and then the landed costs. Um, whatever duties, taxes um, are, are placed on top of that. So for us, if we have a local assembly plant, that reduces the cost um, of, 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 of providing the-, the what, what, is, what is the current level of import duties on, on a handset, for example, at the moment? Well, thankfully for Ghana, the actual, the duty on the handsets is, not, is, is just the VAT and the, the health insurance, which is about 17.5%. So it's still high. Other countries have 30% and above. So it's, it's quite a deterrent. So by the time the person just can't afford it, and if he can't, you have to give him a flexible payment term like a year to be able to afford a handset. So infrastructure, devices is important, but then we need to also start looking at how we digitize the economy itself. So if we're still encouraging um, physical cash, we're not encouraging, if you look at the mobile money service today, penetration is still sub 50%. Now, government payments, government revenue collection, government platforms have all to be digitized. Collection of school fees, remittances, etc. We need to formally make this this um, a more formal process um, to get to get digitized. Um, digital driven driven through businesses should be encouraged to digitize their businesses. Use the technologies that are available. Use the apps that are available. And then we come to health and education. With everything that we have suffered in COVID, it's so unfortunate that we have kids who have been home since March. Somebody called me and said, how can we help the kids? And I said, I have put digital content online and have zero rated it. 
but these kids don't even have access to it. They won't be able to have access. So we need to make an effort for schools to start digitizing their content from the education service, you know, so that it's, and then secondly, the, the ones that have already been digitized, we provide access for the kids to be able to do this. This era of kids can have devices, screen time and everything. I think COVID has broken that myth and, and we, need to, we need to fix it. The last will be education. If we don't educate the, 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 the populace, right? We don't educate people to start thinking that digital is the way to go. We will still be, it may not be COVID, it may be another pandemic, it will be another world crisis, and we'll still have, have this gap. If, if we're able to fix these four things I've mentioned, infrastructure, fix access to devices, fix digitizing the services, and then digitizing especially health and, and education, I think, and then also um, payments. I think we have we have a, a strong opportunity, a very strong opportunity to, to become a more digitized and more formalized economy. Thank you, Patricia. That's very helpful. Some very useful ideas in there. Um, Professor Dambata, how do you think about the digital economy? One thing I've noticed is um, governments in Africa are very keen to do things like tax the international uh, social media companies, but actually are kind of less keen to provide incentives to create that digital economy and that digital transformation. How does NCC think about those problems? Well, um, let me start, Russell, by saying we, all, we already have a policy in place to drive a digital economy. Assume we are about the only African country with such a policy. The Nigerian digital economy policy and strategy was about eight pillars. And I don't want to bother you about the pillars, but of course, no, no strategy is complete without pillars, in my view. Exactly. So it has, this one has eight pillars. And from Russell, one of the pillars is, um, you know, solid infrastructure. The very infrastructure that I've been talking to you about. There is soft infrastructure. There are, you know, there are pillars on digital skills, you know, emerging technologies and so on and so forth. Then there is the new national broadband plan you know, another policy document for the years 2020 to 2025, you know, spelling out, you know, the, 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 the various milestones, you know, we need to attain in order to make the digital transformation story, you know, a success story. Then you have to ask, if you want to digitally transform, then what are, what are the elements of the digital transformation ecosystem? And if you will come up with this, that you need institutional enabling policies and institutions, which we have on the ground already. You need a very strong ICT industry. You need to concentrate on the, you know, the human capital, build that critical mass of ICT adoption and usage, because that ultimately is going to drive the broadband penetration. Okay, that is what is going to drive businesses. That is what, go what is going to transform governance as well as key sectors you know, of the economy. So I will, I will stop there. I think in Nigeria, we all have the policies in place uh, to transit from the legacy economy you know, to the digital economy in all cases. And I think government has come up with additional policies, the relaxation, the 30% reduction you know, for as a five-year status incentives for investors coming into the country. 30% reduction in company income tax is a very, very incentive, uh, important incentive that will attract investors. And government is thinking of you know, additional incentives that are captured in the various documents of government. You know, um, if the, my counterpart, you know, the, 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 the lady in charge of you know, investment opportunities in this country were here, I'm sure he would have been able to tell you more. Nigeria is ready to go. All the policies are in place. What remains to be done is to implement various aspects of those policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, Abayomi, I know that your CEO, Funki Apeka, is very um, committed to startups, particularly, obviously, digital startups, given the company you are and has given bandwidth to support incubators and so on and so forth. How do you see the role of startups and what is needed in terms of regulation and legislation, do you think, to make their lives easier so that they can begin to create the digital economy? 
I mean, good question, Russell. And, you know, um, I'm just going to borrow a lift slightly from Patricia, who is fundamentally talking about democratizing access. And, you know, um, we have a, if you look at Nigeria um, from a demographic perspective, we have a very young population. About 80% of our population is um, um, under 40. Um, the, the people between 18 to to, to about 40 also make up about, you know, 50% of the entire population. And those are the real economic actors that you want to ensure that they have access to um, internet to be able to bring about their ideas. Um, um, in terms of um, um, that segment, we, we've seen considerable um, um, growth, um, even with the limited resources um, that they've had. Um, just the other day, about three weeks ago, I don't know whether um, one of the areas where, where we've seen a lot of activity has been in the digital payment space, right? And about three weeks ago, or about a month ago, um, Stripe, I think uh, um, there was news about Stripe making a $200 million uh, acquisition uh, of uh, Paystack, one of the uh, um, digital payments uh, infrastructure providers, right? Um, so I think that segment of the, uh, the, 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 the market, uh, definitely we need to continue to strive to provide them with the necessary infrastructure to be able to enable them to continuously innovate um, and to, to, to roll out um, 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 services that can create, uh, can, that can you know, um, sort of bridge the gap um, um, in the market. And one of the two biggest areas that we've seen a lot of activity is in the e-commerce and the digital payment system. But we see a lot in also in the, even in the agricultural space with digital agriculture uh, and people coming out with really innovative uh, solutions uh, in, in that space. So I, I think uh, if you aggregate all of that altogether, it speaks to one thing. Um, we, we, the numbers suggest to, to us, and these are numbers that be rolled out by the um, NBS, um, that a 10% temp 10 increase in broadband penetration uh, ultimately contributes about 1.4 to 1.5% uh, to GDP. Uh, so if you just think about that, um, that suggests to me that if you can continually democratize access and increase broadband penetration uh, astronomically, right, it would have a significant effect in terms of economic activity and GDP within the country. And that also then obviously reinforces the um, um, the, 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 um, um, emphasis for diversification emphasis of this particular government. So, um, are these, are these all important? Extremely so. Are the startup, the startup, uh, uh, ecosystem, we need to continually, um, encourage startup ecosystem. One thing that I've seen, um, I don't know how much you know, um, is that you start to see state governments and even the federal governments, state by state governments, even on the mun uh, municipals, uh, start to set up innovation hubs. And one of the things that we did um, uh, as May 1 was that in um, two particular states, in Edo and Ogu State, was that we partnered with the government who was really um, strongly uh, focused on ICT. And um, we seem to have lost him there. Sorry, we... Oh, we right. You cut off at Great. the end. Just just finish your point, and then I'll come to George. No, 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 no. I, I think the point I was making basically was in terms of you know I don't know what, what which part I got caught off was just setting up innovation hubs in different parts of the state in order to encourage um, um, innovation um, amongst uh, um, the youths. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, George. Yeah, the, the digital transformation is affecting media in a very particular way, isn't it? Because often um, media companies have large online presence, um, but they're not necessarily deriving revenues from that online presence. Give us some idea how the media in Ghana is taking to digital uh, transformation. The, the the truth about that reality is that it's checkered. Uh, disorganized and uh, we are still learning and uh, it's therefore for me as a regulator it's very difficult to uh, make very substantive comments except to point out the lessons that I have learned and those lessons should apply to almost everything that we are discussing now that as regulators we need to begin to have a change in regulatory culture we need to move out of industry control 
to industry facilitation. We need to develop a system that enables uh, industry to drive the process whilst we sharpen the rough edges. Because in the media industry, as it is with the telecoms industry, it appears to me that reg regulation is not as quick and fast and agile as business is. And the more we take the dominant seat, the less we frustrate innovation and speed of development. So that's what I would say. Thank you, George. Very helpful. Olu, I want to come to you lastly about, about digital economy, digital transformation. Um, from your point of view, what, what needs to be done to encourage that? Um, I think across Africa, uh, we're the last frontier, I mean, from an OEM perspective. Uh, and it's very much obvious that we need to learn lessons from other climbs where they've made mistakes along that journey, including the UK where you're sitting in Russell. It mm. took the government 15 years to, e to, to implement e-government, I can remember in my days. So a lot of failed ICT projects. Still um, a work in progress. Coming to Africa, yes, it is. Uh, I'm a, very much in touch with what's going on there. So yes, but they've made progress. And I think that it's a generational thing. And I wanted to add that. So the Gen Zs, the millennials, the way they use the devices. Uh, I mean, in Africa, the mobile device is far different from myself. I'm a Gen X and I'm sure Prof is a, a Gen X. And Russell, I don't know where you are, but let's just imagine the way you use your phone is not the way your lot children- A lot of gray hair, so use yeah. Don't worry, I've discovered mine, I think I've polished mine. Um, so it's important to realize that there is definitely, definitely a different way and a paradigm that needs to be inculcated in the way we do business and the way we see uh, the, well, the majority of the population are below 34, I think. I think in Nigeria is 65%. So that represents a huge, massive amount of intellectual talent that's unrealized. Nollywood is, is, is a massive industry. Um, we have a great uh, music industry. That talent is there. Now, the reality on ground from an operator's point of view, and I think that Patricia might agree to a degree, is that a lot of that content is offshore. And we're building a lot of fiber, especially because we've got five undersea cables trying to bring that talent back inshore. That shouldn't be the case. So we need to host that talent, convert it into digital content or into digital assets and locate it locally. So we'll increase the use of IXPNs, we'll have more data centers, there'll be fiber that's interconnected in a coherent manner that is to this talent, and then you drive an industry and an ecosystem that's self-sustaining. I think what we're doing right now in terms of the digital transformation is that a lot of our stuff is hosted offshore, and it's on platforms that are public. So the area around DP, uh, NDP, N NDPR, the areas around protection, sovereignty, is still something that's work in progress. And, you know, you have to give governments uh, sort of a, a, a leeway here because they've got a lot of issues they've got to deal with. And um, one of the areas that I am very sure about is that as far as technology is concerned, and this is a big challenge, it's, I've never seen any government that's ahead of technology. They're usually reactive. And I think it's more the case in Africa and especially in Nigeria than than it is maybe in other climes that uh, have imbibed uh, digital technology as a tool across the demographics. So what we need to do is what I stated earlier. And then in addition, focus on education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics from an early age so that they can start to build the artificial intelligence of the future. So it's not biased to foreign ways of actually operating that is actually Africanized. Africanized is a new word here. And also machine learning and other areas because what we might run the risk is that we're still importing knowledge transfer or technology, but we're not adding value. And I think there's a great opportunity to do outsourcing, adding value, and then instilling uh, an e-government platform so that we move from in to actually utilizing uh, the technology to increase efficiency and, our pro and productivity. Uh, I think that's, I'll leave that at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Olo. I want to go back to Abayomi. And 
I understand that um, Main One has had investment from Facebook uh, or a Facebook investment vehicle to help expand into the states you were talking about. I wonder whether you could speak a little about that to give some sense of how that works. Okay, so just a slight point of correction. We didn't have any investments by, by Facebook. We, we did collaborate. Can you yep, hear me? Fair enough. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, right. We did collaborate together on a couple of projects, um, um, which again was to enhance the democratization of access um, um, in those areas. Um, and just to slightly pivot also um, to, to re and re echo what Olu was talking about um, in terms of uh, um, the opportunities. Um, and the, the reason is quite clear why we all want to do that. Um, one of the areas, you know, that we've been looking at on a big scale is on the data centers um, and data residency side of things. And there are loads of opportunities. And Odu is extremely right, because if you think about, um, I think the numbers are that maybe about 80% of the data that, um, that um, um, is in Nigeria is actually hosted offshore. Um, and we need to change that paradigm um, slightly uh, because also uh, there's a big contributory factor to our own economy. Uh, but also it's not just, you know, being um, patriotic that's going to do that. It's actually providing the infrastructure that is, you're sure that is able to warehouse uh, the data and is also able to ensure that there's integrity in, in those systems. And there has to be a lot of focus in terms of that um, um, because also even from a sovereignty uh, perspective and from even from a, um, a national security perspective you, you you see that the trend also is most um, countries um, whether uh, across um, um, the, U the North America or Europe you know there's a lot of strong emphasis emphasis on um, how the utilization of that data is is is, is appropriated so again um, I think that's one area that we definitely need to, 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 to look at. And um, the regulator has done some, uh, some bit of work. Um, I, I think what also needs to happen is that um, um, what we're looking at the reg regulator doing is that creating a real strong level playing field um, um, that allows indigenous companies to grow and to compete in, in this area. Um, um, one of the things that we've seen, and I know you've seen it as well, uh, with some of the things that happen in other countries is there's a, um, there's, you start to see, I don't know whether because of the anti-globalization move, but you start to see a lot of strong protectionist type of regulation. Um, um, and we're hoping that we're gonna see that because um, um, in terms of OTTs uh, that are able to operate um, outside without having any local presence, you know, that also is a big issue in the market uh, because obviously it means that in terms of capital that is being, um, that is being um, extracted from the country without commensurate investment is a bit of worry. Um, um, and it's something that, you know, we would really like uh, the regulator to, to look at um, and to have that kind of, you know, um, um, nuanced view uh, so as to ensure that, you know, in terms of the indigenous companies, they're not completely eroded. So I think that's a big, that's a big thing for, 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 for me personally, um, um, uh, from a regulatory perspective. Um, also, even though I do concede that, um, you know, just the same way the OECD countries had to come up with the base erosion and profit shifting BEPS, uh, sort of policy, we also add the, uh, the significant presence, a significant economic presence uh, policy where we were, we're going to be looking at um, 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 sort of, you know, digital companies that are extracting a lot of value, but are not given commensurate investment or uh, doing their own share bit in terms of uh, uh, the amount of capital that they realize from Nigeria. But there's still a, quite a bit that needs to also still happen, even though the right steps has been taken, but to ensure that we protect, uh, and I'm sure it's the same thing in Ghana as well. And, you know, those are, that is, that is the worry, you know, um, before we all run out of business. Um, yeah.
Thanks a lot. That's very helpful. I want to pick up on that theme of protectionism because one of the participants, Mike Nelson, has been asking um, Patricia whether Vodafone has come under any pressure not to be using Huawei, for example. Um, in Africa, no, we haven't. I mean, this is something that for now has stayed in Europe and in Ghana, no. Okay, that's helpful. That's the answer to that question. I want to move now into the last segment, um, which is, will this momentum that COVID-19 has given, which Professor Dambata was talking about, you know, kind of how well the telco sector had done in Nigeria, and I'm sure that's true probably in many other countries, will that progress be maintained? Um, and perhaps we could come to um, uh, George, what do you think? Do you think that progress will be maintained? I can only hope so for now. And I think that the indications are fairly clear, at least in the case of Ghana, that the, our options are limited and that the few little things, both from industry and from government as in regulators and all, is what has sustained us. It seems to me that it's also taught, particularly those of us from the regulatory side, it's taught us extremely important lessons that if we cooperated more with industry, they tend to have considerable uh, flexibility and agility in responding to situations faster than us. And so what we need to do is to provide them the needed incentives to drive the processes whilst we offer safeguards for the public interest. In that sense, I tend to believe very strongly that the momentum will be sustained even if uh, at a slow pace. Thank you, George. Um, Olu, what do you think about the, 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 all of the things we've been talking about and whether they will keep going or whether people will simply revert back to old ways of behavior? I think that our macroeconomic situation in Africa, and in particular West Africa and Nigeria, would indicate that we have no choice um, I believe that there's opportunity for efficiency improvement. Uh, I believe that the yearns of the youth is growing. I believe that we need to create jobs with no uncertainty uh, within a short time frame, rather than a medium to long. And I believe that technology provides that catalyst and opportunity. Uh, I believe that it is no gainsaying to say that we cannot just rely on extractive industries anymore to uh, feed. I believe that uh, if you look at uh, the recent acquisition of intellectual properties, as Yomi has stated, 200 million paystack deal, you know, I think that there are great opportunities for unicorns to happen, but they will come out from the ICT sector. Uh, I believe that globalization will still continue. Uh, the threats of the big tech companies will still be here. I realize there's renewed interest now. Uh, to Africa is one uh, where there's a significant investment on the 34,000 kilometer cable that's going around Africa. So, you know, there are some long-term bets on Africa and those long-term bets require short-term solutions to get to those long-term bets. Uh, so I'm excited over the next five to seven years that there will be uh, a continued momentum. Uh, it might not be in the shape and form that we would like it to be, but I think that uh, even government realizes that those that are laggards uh, will just be left behind because we need to start to tune our economies towards the youth. Uh, and that is preparing them for the future. Otherwise, they would not be able to participate amongst their peers in the future. So no option uh, is, the, is the answer. Thank you. And Patricia, how does it look from the operator's point of view in Ghana? Well, I, I also agree with the panelists. I don't believe that we have a lot of options. I think we will see an accelerated drive towards um, broadband access. Government announced in July that they, in their mid-year budget submission, that they were going to um, allow the telcos to partner with the electricity company to drive broadband um, fiber into all, all tertiary institutions, all secondary institutions. 
this is something that would have happened. And I believe um, this is going to be sustained. The other one is um, businesses are going to have to start looking at the future of work, um, creating a more digital workplace, a more digital workforce, more collaborative tools. I don't believe these things will change post COVID. I think there'll be a lot more penetration into the use of mobile money, um, mobile financial services, um, and that will drive a more formalized um, economy. So I think new jobs will also start coming up. Um, anytime I speak to the youth, I tell them to look out for the new skill sets that they require. People are no longer recruiting for job roles. I think people are recruiting for skill sets, and this is going to be the new direction um, that the world is going. So I think it will bring um, a more forward-looking um, way of working. I think the last one is what George raised, which is a more collaborative effort between um, operators and the regulator, and also with governments. I mean, we will bring our expertise, we'll bring the investment, but I think if we don't get the leadership and the collaboration from them, then a lot of the efforts that we'll put in, we will not be able to see the national benefit. Thank you, Patricia. That's a very good summary, I think. Professor Dambata, from your point of view, what, what do you think will stick from these transformations that have happened? Uh, well, Russell, um, as a regulator, every month I give e-readiness statistics. I give information on voice, mobile penetration, broadband penetration. I think uh, May one mentioned one just now, you know, I listened to him. I give statistics on internet penetration, data usage, but I, I want to make a very strong point here that all these are not ends in themselves. Really, you know, so the ends of digital transformation are to build shared and sustainable prosperity. And we need to ask ourselves whether this is happening in this part of the world to alleviate poverty, to improve learning, Russell, to build or create an, a, a competitive and innovative economy and to have a more mobile, open and cohesive society. If we can find a way to measure all this ends and say, this is where we are, then I agree with you, we're making progress in our digital transformation journey. Thank you very much. This is my final takeaway. Okay, thank you. Abayami, what about you? Yeah, um, I think I agree with every, what everybody has said. Um, I, I don't need to re-echo uh, any of those. Um, uh, I think we, we do not have a choice but to continue to uh, make the necessary investments and also to, to make the necessary um, um, to adapt to the rising demands, um, both whether from uh, whether from the consumer's perspective or also from uh, our own internal uh, 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 shareholders um, uh, demands. Um, I, I think um, the the in terms of in the next um, from a policy perspective, especially, I think we in Nigeria, the regulator has done as you, as um, the EVC might have mentioned before. I think two two significant documents from a policy side has already defined what we need to do. The issue is the implementation, making sure that the implementation of those policy documents, be it the digital economy, uh, um, the digital economy uh, 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 policy document, or the Nigerian um, broadband uh, plan, um, ensuring that those two strong policy documents. Um, they are able to achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves uh, over the five-year term. I think that is what I would, would be great to see. And if we can do that, um, you, we are going to see real accelerated growth. Uh, and we're going to see um, a, 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 the youth being more engaged and opportunities for more unicorns to happen uh, um, on, a, on, a, on a more on a scalable basis. Um, you know, th those are those are the things that I would I would like to say. Uh, I know I okay. have to see. Yeah, I want to do one closeout question, and um, I give you just a little bit of time to think about it. Um, if we were looking in five years' time, what do you think would have happened in five years' time, in terms of this conversation? 
what would the changes, what the key changes be in five years time? And what would they look like? Because quite often we have these discussions about, oh, we must implement the policy and we must, you know, we must hit the business target. Yeah. We must do this, but actually what's, what's the life going to look like? You know, Professor Dan Barter was talking about alleviating poverty and actually in a sense, all of this coming together to, to spread something for everybody. What's, yeah. what's it going to look like in five years time if we manage to get any, any or all of this right? Yeah. Um, We're able to look into our crystal balls. Exactly. I'm going to go to Olu because Olu's never short of, short of a thought on things of this kind. So Olu first. Yeah, you know, I'm optimistic anyway, and uh, I like to create a, an environment that I'm used to, which is uh, to see that uh, in the case of Nigeria and West Africa, actually, I like what Petra said, that there's a collaboration between their operator and their electric company. Because, you know, I came from a company where we actually had uh, broadband, um, a fiber cable anyway, on uh, uh, electric uh, infrastructure. So, and I know that exists in Scotland, for instance. So, mm. you know, one of the things that I think is needed, and the story is for Africa, even with the 5G uh, label on the tin, is we need a lot more fiber connectivity. So it's still a connectivity story, uh, a connectivity story that makes it ubiquitous. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, Professor Dambata spoke about 774 local government authorities. We need to connect those. Uh, that has been a long-term ambition for Nigeria over the years. Uh, but I see that happening over the next five years. Uh, and therefore, and definitely on the back of that, an increased uh, penetration of 4G. I think we're targeting 90% uh, population or geographic coverage by 2025. Uh, that's doable if we have fiber to the towers. Uh, and then some, uh, I think, early use cases of 5G in non-standalone uh, st standalone, um, formations. You know, I see that happening in, in five years. Um, I would love to see a lot more women, uh, you know, using uh, internet and the ICT for product productive usage. Uh, we are targeting um, 5 million uh, females uh, in addition to uh, what we've got right now to reduce the gender gap uh, because we believe that uh, women uh, using ITCT is a very powerful thing for any economy. Uh, and in Africa, that isn't the case right now. Uh, and then I would like to see the power improved. So the recent um, partnership with Siemens, so that's in between the federal government and Siemens, I'd like to see an improvement in the power uh, because it's the bedrock of any industrialized society. We need to move to fourth industrial revolution and without power, it's gonna be a struggle. I can, I can assure you that. Um, so those are the tip bits, you know, I would love to give you a long list, but I think if we can achieve those fundamentals, I think then- I was gonna say that list is rise. almost long enough. I think it is. I think that you yeah. see a new rise in Africa, the new dawn of Africa uh, coming yeah. up onto this, you know, because I think we, do, yeah. we don't lack the population. At 1.3 billion in Africa, I think that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of young, vibrant, energetic youth who can utilize the, those foundational infrastructure blocks that will be laid. Thank you. And Patricia, what, what do you think five years time? What's it going to look like? I, I only see opportunity and it would be unfortunate if we come back in five years and everything we would say didn't happen because like we said the, the median age is quite low in Ghana it's about 21, 21 years and so all I see is opportunity for the youth um, to, to have access to what most of us didn't have which is the, the access to, to technology and be able to produce um, in a more smarter way because if you introduce technology into the way they do business they will, their returns, they will be more efficient in the way they do it. So for me, I'm seeing more efficient businesses um, springing up because of what technology is going to bring. I also see an acceleration of 4G and 5G in Africa. I think we should leapfrog what has happened in, in Europe and, and close the gap. And so right now with COVID having established technology, I mean, telecommunication as an essential service, I think we can only take advantage of that and drive it. The next one I see will be a drive for uh, mobile financial services penetration. Like I said, it's still below 50%. And anytime you have equipped a woman with financial skills, 
um, you open up a, a whole world of access because she's able to save, she's able to take care of her family. 10 people get to go to school. It just, it just keeps expanding. So for me, it's driving mobile financial services um, penetration, I think will be, will be very, very good. Global competitiveness, so access to talent, I think would improve in Africa because now in the past, the, it was so difficult to get people to even migrate to Africa to come and work for you. Now, it's, it's, I think the myth is broken. He can sit in his country um, and then connect and work. We have been working in hope since March. Um, we only step in the office when it's necessary. So we will close that global competitiveness gap in terms of access to talent um, and be able to, to open up to the world of opportunity, even schools. I mean, people are now attending great schools online, you know, and, and I think it's just a world of opportunity I see for, for Africa. Patricia, thank you very much. Again, some very useful insights. Abayomi. I'm looking through the crystal ball. Um, I thought maybe uh, if you, there's a good question to, to me, I've asked um, maybe Mr. Trump. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, in terms of, um, I, I think what all the panelists have said, um, Yes, um, but I see that in the next five years, there's going to be more stronger economic integration across Africa, underpinned by, uh, I don't know how much you follow, um, but underpinned by the African Continental Free Trade Zone, uh, African Continental Free uh, um, 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 Agreement, uh, which is supposed to also liberalize trade across Africa. Um, uh, and so trade and um, trade of goods and services across Africa. So I think you're going to see a lot stronger economic in integration, and as well as movement of services uh, um, in Africa. I also think that you know, as um, there's going to be, as you had we had mentioned before, um, as technology continues to evolve, um, stronger convergence in terms of communication as well um, um, in Africa. Um, um, and I, I, I also. So, um, so I also think, uh, like um, Ulu might have mentioned already, which are all the <laughs> policy objectives of those policy documents that, that um, I initially talked about, uh, I think we're definitely going to see more stronger um, 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 national fiber coverage um, than we have right now, definitely. And it is going to obviously uh, lead to uh, significant economic activity in the areas of um, digital finance. Um, I, I see significant economic activity in there. Um, in the areas of e-commerce, um, more and more significant economic activity is going to happen in those areas. And also, I, I would say my own third play would be in the area of um, e-government, um, as governments um, um, state governments and federal governments uh, move towards um, digitizing their processes uh, uh, um, of various ministries, departments, and agencies of government in order to ensure that there's efficiency. Uh, so uh, I, I see, I think um, those are areas where I think that in the next five years, we are going to see, um, um, and also one last thing, in terms of the cultural shift to work from home, I think is is something that is um, air to stay. Uh, there was a bit of I think we we're quite conservative um, in uh, Nigeria and just generally in Africa. Um, I think there was a bit of resistance to you know flexi and work from home kind of. But I think work from home is air to say stay, which is obviously going to increase the demand for FTTH, and which, as I said, is um, 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 also plays into so, some of the other drivers that um, we had already mentioned. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. George, what do you think is going to happen if we were having this conversation in five years' time? Well, I, I think that if there is anything I have learned, it is that when our physical spaces are closed, technology offers us a second life as we have seen through COVID. And that for us as regulators, in the next five years, the biggest contribution that we can make would be to understand that as businesses pursue innovation, efficiency, and growth, our job is to represent them in the spaces that they are not available, to advocate for them, and to offer the policy framework that enables them to do what they know how to do best. They have helped us to survive this crisis. We need to look beyond the horizon to see what else they can do. In other ways, 
we need to begin to change our regulatory framework to see industry as enablers and our job as the facilitators that carry on that enablement. Thank you. Thank you, George. Professor Dambata, um, if you're still there, um, what in the next five years do you think will happen? Nope, I think he might well have gone. So I'm gonna to come to my closing remarks. I don't have a lot to say at this stage. Um, some very, very interesting contributions from all the speakers. Uh, like to thank all the speakers for those contributions and um, like to thank the International Institute of Communications for making all this possible. Thank you. <laughs>